Hey guys, this will be video 19 for the uh, 50s gold top uh, Les Paul replica using Stuart McDonald templates. And I'm primarily going to be focusing on talking about the, the just the headstock overlay and how your overlay options uh, can have uh, an incredible impact on, on the, the job. But I'll get a couple of things out of the way. And uh, I think I think the guy, I think your name was Graham. Someone left me a message on one of the earlier videos, or well, it was, I think it was last night's video where he got confused about what I was talking about, about the, the nut location getting too far off of the uh, fretboard or off the lower. I'm gonna discuss that a little bit. And uh, I don't know if you erased your message or if it got deleted or, or whatnot. And, and it, wasn't a, it wasn't a stupid question, so don't ever feel like any question is, is, a, is a dumb question because if you don't know, you don't know. And you won't learn unless you ask. So I'm going to talk about gluing the overlay, the uh, veneer over the headstock face. And uh, we'll just dive right in. We'll talk about some of those options. And also, it's kind of funny because I noticed you had asked the question about uh, me being an Alabama fan. But my red sweatshirt does not say Alabama. It says Palm Beach. <laughs> so anyway, I don't really care about the whole Alabama Auburn fan thing even though I am from Alabama. So, all right, let's, let me get back on point. Uh, okay. What I was talking about <clears throat> with, uh, running into the hazards of, uh, if the neck starts moving too far into the body, um, like the lower, well, you can't change the location of the fretboard. It really needs to stay, uh, in, in it, it, it really needs to stay at the 16th fret is what I'm saying where it joins the body and if you start making a quarter of an inch change here or an eighth of an inch change here and uh, if the neck lower starts sliding in well then you're gonna lose the whole guitar layout because I don't know if that's in the video but nonetheless and I'm not gonna revisit this stuff but you're you're working from a very um, determined point from the very front end and then once you define that point you build the guitar based on that one point and in this this guitar it's based on the uh, the tailpiece uh, 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 stud and anchor location now that doesn't mean that I can't change that location because it's basically a half inch hole I could move it seven sixteenths of an inch if I need to but I don't want to because I don't want to continually be re-engineering the job. So uh, when you build this guitar, if you're keeping it traditional, you want that 16th fret to land perfectly over the, the join uh, at the body. In other words, that's the 16th fret location. And, and if this starts creeping in a little bit, well, that fretboard uh, doesn't need to creep in with it. It's going to have to stay in relation to the body. And, and then, what, what, in turn, what will happen is as this neck lower starts sliding up under the fretboard, then your uh, the nut, which was intended to land, the, 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 the top side of the nut is intended to land right at the edge of the turn. See, that's a 17 degree pitch. So as soon as that headstock starts pitching, that's where you want your fret, your uh, uh, the nut location to end. But if this lower starts creeping up in this direction, well then your neck start your uh, nut starts traveling into the headstock overlay. That's what I'm talking about. And I'm going to cover that a little bit more. But uh, also backing up to the very beginning. Every bit of that would have needed to have been engineered on the front end <clears throat> based on the type of overlay you were going to do. If your overlay is an eighth of an inch thick, which uh, most of the overlays from, I think the company's called Crazy Parts out of Germany, they have a really nice uh, replacement overlays. And But you got to engineer that stuff in because you couldn't build this five eighths of an inch thick and then put an eighth inch overlay on top of it. So what do you change? You don't change this top line, see this being a flat line, and then a 17 degree pitch, you change the thickness on the back. So you would come in here 
and you would take whatever you added to the top veneer and let's say you wanted a target of five eighths of an inch well whatever you add up here you've got to deduct it from your um, your lower so you would be taking off an eighth of an inch and in uh, my past videos um, where I built the 50s uh, uh, custom black beauty and or burst that's exactly what we did and I had to make this headstock uh, well, it was, it was exactly a half inch thick up here, and it was uh, 7 sixteenths of an inch thick up here, which uh, that was that's right at the threshold. You wouldn't want to go any thinner. But nonetheless, once you do put that veneer on, uh, in order to, to get the strength back, and, and I really encouraged Ethan, uh, please make certain that you epoxy glue your uh, Vulcan fiber on because that will in fact probably make it a lot stronger than even even just uh, uh, regular wood but your 50s guitar they didn't have that Vulcan fiber they just basically had a really thin layer of holly and it was stained black and then painted black and then they did all the inlay everything was kind of handmade well it was handmade to my knowledge there in-house in other words, they didn't outsource their veneer overlays. Uh, so again, you're, this head, that's what I meant in one of the videos where, and the, the headstock is just the headstock alone is a video series, not just a single video, but you could do a 10 part video series on just all your headstock options. So I hope that answers your question, Graham. Um, and if, if not, you know, feel free to give me a, give me a shout or make another comment and uh, I'll answer it. So what, what we want to do next is uh, I want to show you how I would go about gluing that veneer on the surface. And I'll get this stuff off the table to try to keep it somewhat clean. Let me check the time. Seven minutes. Okay. Uh, let, me, let me kick it into high gear because I do not want this to be a very long video. Uh, all right. I'm not going to talk too much about um, the veneer options, but roughly this is under an eighth of an inch. But uh, if you were doing a veneer, or let's say you made some sort of mistake like that, and you, and you're and you're just you're freaking out because you're thinking, oh my gosh, how do I? I'm gonna have to have this nut come all the way out here. Well, then that's that's no big deal. On the front end, you should have left this long enough to correct for errors. And if you didn't, well, then that's that's gonna be your problem because you you made a mistake. But what you would do if you ran into that problem, you just add, add the veneer according to the thickness that you need. Hopefully it's not much, but then you'll have to do exactly what I just said. You'll come in and you'll remove material on the back and you'll need to epoxy this down. If you can get a good clamping force, tight bond is perfectly fine right here. Why? Because you can get a call, a clamping call on the top and you can really put and you can put six or eight clamps up there and just really uh, crush with crushing pressure so you get a get a really good glue up but nonetheless um, uh, oh I'm not actually gonna be working with that so I need to leave it on the table I hope that makes sense but what we're gonna do is um, look at what scrap material we got left over this is maple veneer I got this from Woodcraft um, uh, what is it 40 uh, something square feet I believe oh, tw 12 square feet 12 square foot pack uh, $22 sequence matched I don't know the width it's probably six inches wide by 30 oh it probably says it's 48 inch length width is four and a half to 7.5 so $22 uh, how long have I had that probably a year and a half two years and just use it for stuff like this end up with a scrap like that um, look at how you might want to use it in the future in other words don't just come up here and, and cut this raw because you might not leave yourself enough material for your next job so and I know for a fact that that uh, that's probably how I will be using the rest of this veneer is for two overlays like 50 style overlays where they don't have the Vulcan fiber so I made my mark that's what I meant by make yourself a bunch of little paper templates and you can always just grab them up and you don't even need a, uh, a measuring tape. I don't know if this is on the camera. It doesn't really matter because I want to rock it through this. 
I'm just taking a, a exacto knife, a square, score it a couple of times. You know, I had the had the square on there. Scored it a couple of times. Break right off, and then decide which one you want to use. You don't want to wet these, but you want to make sure it's really clean. So, uh, <clears throat> if you wet them, they'll start going crazy and curling up, even if you wet them with like a uh, lacquer thinner. But you do want to wet this. Uh, I, I'm out of lacquer thinner, uh, which uh, I've got to get some more. Acetone is, uh, I really like using my acetone for doing binding work, but the acetone and or the lacquer thinner um, will open up this grain, clean the, it'll clean the dust off of it. Is, it, is this overkill? Um, I don't think so. Not if you're building a multi-thousand dollar guitar. Um, does it have to be done? Yeah, not necessarily. This will give you a quick reference of what you can expect color-wise and grain variation. Um, you know, just, I won't spend any time with that, but it turned out pretty good. Could it have been better? Uh, maybe, maybe not. Uh, but the cool thing about that is, uh, I'm fine with the uh, annular rings, the, the growth ring orientation. And then if anything, I'm really good with nitro and tents and stuff like that. Um, I can make, you know, what disappear and or appear. I mean, you almost have to be a, a, a magician when you're, when you're doing this stuff, because that's what I was talking about. Sometimes even the, like the jazz guitars, uh, they'll come in with a veneer on the back. And then uh, like if it was going to be mahogany, they'll put a mahogany veneer and then they'll, they'll just feather the mahogany in and the untrained eye, they don't even see it. They're, it feathers in so well that uh, those guys that do veneer work, uh, it's amazing what they're able to do. And I witnessed some of it in South Florida uh, when I uh, had my, my, my boat, I had a really old, large vintage sport fisher yacht and the boat yard that I, where I kept my boat uh, they were doing uh, an enormous amount of, of extremely high-end uh, yacht repair. We're talking, you know, million-dollar yachts. We come in that were made in Europe, and uh, they'd bring in a veneer specialist and do cabinet work that was just multi, multi, multi-thousand dollars, and it was amazing what those guys were able to do with uh, veneer. So I never got to do much veneer work. But uh, have a. I'm gonna clean this just a little bit, but not let it get too wet. But those guys, uh, it's amazing what you can do once you learn how to do veneer work, and especially for furniture building and or uh, uh, built-in cabinet work. We're talking big money, big money. If you're good with your tools and you're considering uh, starting some sort of business, uh, move to South Florida and learn how to do veneer work and uh, you'll, you'll do extremely well. All right, I'm gonna pause the camera, make some epoxy, and then we're gonna glue this down. Okay, let's dive back in. Um, basically what you wanna do here to keep from wasting your material, just take your template. This, is, this template is actually a little bit bigger than uh, the actual headstock but in the event in the event you don't have enough epoxy there's no sense in wasting all your epoxy around the perimeter you just want to put the epoxy wherever wherever you need it uh, this has been uh, <clears throat> this has been kicking for about uh, eight seven to eight minutes uh, on a molecular level I'll talk about that some other time but um, basically you just want to, uh, I knew I'd forget to do this. The reason I have that tape up there is you want to protect that uh, end grain right there. 
It's not the finished guitar, but it's pretty darn close to it. And if any epoxy got in that end grain, it might uh, really uh, hurt your ability to do uh, tent work, stain work, or any, any, in other words, any sort of faux work to protect. Uh, in other words, it might hinder your ability to do uh, faux stain work because that body is considerably darker than this uh, headstock, this neck. Everything on the side will be will be cut off. See how good I am left-handed. So hard working on camera because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to just turn this around. I can't. Apparently, I'm not very good cutting tape left-handed. I can do everything else left-handed. I'm, I'm just about ambidextrous from working so long. I'm not careful. I'm going to get the dumbass award here. Uh, another reason why I like working with the epoxy, it gives you time to make a fool of yourself on camera and not, not lose your cool. Um, I got another 40 minutes work time with that epoxy. Different story with tight bond, and trust me, the tight bond would run, that it would harm that end grain as well. So, uh, this is oversized about a quarter of an inch. All right, now I can get back to where I was. I hope that's on the camera. 17 minutes. I think I already clarified that the uh, epoxy has kicked on a molecular level. I got, I got weights. I, I don't know what happened. I'm usually really good at mixing my epoxy as far as a area, but uh, I mixed way too much on this one. I was probably just kind of fearful of uh, trying to keep this video short. So I mixed too much. And uh, I'll try to think of something else in the shop that I need to repair and or needs to be epoxy because I don't want to waste that stuff. Uh, Again, I do, I love the epoxy, not just because it's a little bit slower, it gives me more time to work the job, but uh, it it has a, a, a bearing on the tone that is, uh, has not been, uh, to my knowledge, no one has done any sort of uh, research on, but I have in the in house here, uh, I've done some comparatives between tight bond and epoxy and the epoxy uh, is there's no way it could not be a uh, hundred percent better at contributing tone transfer if there's thickness of glue there in other words if you were making a repair and you had a problematic surface and, and some of the area had there had to be some epoxy left in there this stuff is going to dry uh, rock hard and you'll come back 10 days from now and you can barely snap that in half so it's almost like steel but you you put you, you take that same amount if you put tight bond on there and even if you wipe it real thin uh, even if it's super thin it remains like a basketball so if you, if you're able to do a really nice clamping if you have like this, you're able to do really good clamping, so you don't need the epoxy. You don't have to have the epoxy. But I do like knowing that the epoxy is under there because it's going to penetrate into this material and um, be a substantial uh, join and be really, really, really superior. I'm going to take a chance here, and I'm just going to I'm just going to do this because I like the idea of being able to push this into the grain. 
and I don't think the epoxy is going to cause this to start uh, curling up. But if you're working with exotic veneers, uh, man, that stuff is uh, it'll it'll humble you very quickly. And I don't know if you could use epoxy on like a, like a burl. I do know that there's some sort of process you go through where it's there's some sort of like milky chemical. It's like a, I think you mix it with water, and then you saturate that into the burl veneer, and then you clamp it in order to try to flatten it out and things like that. <clears throat> um, if you're curious about doing veneer, just drop by your local woodcraft. If you have a woodcraft and or equivalent, I know if you're in South Florida, there's a place called Constantine's in um, Fort Lauderdale. Uh, that guy is extremely knowledgeable. And uh, anyway, or just go online. Uh, I'm sure there's probably somebody on YouTube that shows you how to do veneer. But nonetheless, that makes me feel better knowing that I've got that uh, pressed down into the grain. And now I can take some of this off and not have to worry about having too much. One thing that I've noticed about doing these videos, it makes you realize every part of building a guitar or, or if we were building a chair or a table, uh, there's just so many little operations that you got to go through that uh, that's really about all it takes. You don't have to be a master veneer, <laughs> you know, guy. You just need to be willing to take the time and uh, do the job. And uh, I'm going to clean my hands a little bit here. Let me pause and get uh, cleaned up a little bit. Okay, I'll try to end this video as quickly as possible. If you, if you want to do a lot of veneer work, uh, you need to invest in a J roller. This is a number uh, 1200B. I've had this probably oh, at least 30 years, 20, 25 to 30 years. Um, I think I paid about 50 or 60 bucks for it then. Uh, they're worth a, an enormous amount. But I did just put it down by hand and put it, you know, you saw how thin everything was. Uh, and the fact that I put it on both surfaces, as soon as I kissed that, uh, it made a real nice vacuuming contact. And I know for a fact that if you do that with, with a tight bond, it'll start trying to come loose on the corner. And then you run the risk of it, that air attacking it where it curled up and you end up with a, a, a situation where you're jumping through your, you know what, trying to get it under control, especially if you've got a veneer that has a pattern or a center line, uh, if, you, if that's the case, you need to be working with a clear acrylic call, and you need to be working with center lines and stuff like that. And um, I wouldn't dare use a tight bond if I'm working with a center line oriented veneer because I, I want to see that whole job uh, until it's dry. Uh, but anyway, all I'm saying is it didn't lift just by hand, and uh, I haven't even J-rollered it yet. But typically, uh, the, I'm just going to put my force right here. But typically, you're putting force here and here. And if you're doing a, like a large area, it is amazing how much pressure. See, that's not even sliding. That's amazing. I was expecting it to start creeping a little bit, but it's not. So that J-roller will really guarantee that you've got a phenomenal... Uh, you know, spread of the glue. So let's check it out and see what's going on. Uh, still going to put a, a call on it and hold it down. I think uh, one thing you might could do, let me see if I, yeah, that's slide. It's still sliding around. So see, that's the beauty of the epoxy. Um, I could go make a pot of coffee, as I joke, come back 10 minutes and still push this around. And you might even, if you're working with a veneer, just sit here for about 10 or 15 minutes and, and you've already made pencil marks or you've got a center line and just uh, just move it around until you make certain that you're staying on your center 
and just uh, hold it by hand. And within about uh, 20 to 30 minutes, it'll start setting. And then you'll realize, yeah, I've got, I've got my job or, or you'll see any sort of issues that need to be addressed. I'm not, I don't even have any clamps on it, no calls, nothing. And I could sit here for uh, as long as I need, you know, 20 minutes until it starts setting. And then I go from there. Another trick you might do I learned this from uh, some of the veneer guys down in South Florida. I think it's called stitch where you, where you have stitch tape and it's a water-based tape that like if you're gluing two veneers together, you tape the two veneers, <clears throat> you tape the two veneers together and then you glue them atop whatever you're gluing them on. And it's so cool. I made friends with this guy. He built uh, skateboards. He built longboards, and uh, it's so cool. He shipped them all over the world, and the guy was just crazy cool and so much fun to hang out with. But he taught me how to do the stitch taping, and so that would that would guarantee that your veneer doesn't start going crazy on that side. But uh, be careful about doing too much tape because you might lose, uh, you know, you might lose the ability to look at. Uh, look at the job. All right, I'm going to